a Johnny Goldmane, one of the standout characters in Magic the Gathering's growing list of prominent legendary creatures. He's been the focus of the game's story as well as its marketing material for several years now, ever since his introduction to the game as one of the original Planeswalker cards printed in 2007 with the Lorwyn set. Ajani continues to be a driving force in MTG's story to this day, but who is he? And what is his lore? Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Simon, bringing you more Magic the Gathering lore. In today's comprehensive history, we'll be discussing the Leonin Planeswalker, Ajani Goldmane. We'll go over his complete story in MTG, as well as how his Planeswalker cards have evolved over the years to match with his character development in the lore. I won't spend too much time with introductions because I feel Ajani is a character who really doesn't need any. If you've been a fan of my channel for a long time, you're probably familiar with the video I did on Ajani nearly a decade ago. A lot has happened to Ajani since that video was made, and it's about time we revisit and add to his story. Before we begin though, guys, if you're enjoying the content here at the Ether Hub, consider supporting the channel by leaving this video a like, sharing it with friends, and becoming a subscriber or member of the channel. It all goes a long way in helping us build our community. And now, let's get into the lore. Ajani's story in Magic the Gathering starts back at his very origins, and the divisive world in which he was born. He is a child of Alara, which at this time was still a fractured plane. Once a world lush with all five colors of mana, an ancient calamity tore it asunder, shattering Alara, leaving behind distant pocket planes no longer connected. The Sundering, as it was known, created five new separate planes, each cut off from certain colors of mana. Ajani was born on the Shard of Naya, a wild plane covered in overgrown jungles, exotic vegetation, and terrifying beasts. To some, his people may also be considered beasts. Though some of them would reject that derogatory term, others wear it as a badge of honor. His people are the Leonin, or Nakatl, the cat folk of Alara. To truly know Ajani, we must first learn more about the people he comes from. The Nakatl of Naya are one of the more prominent humanoid races found on the Shard, and at one point, they controlled a sizable empire that spanned from the highest mountains, draped in the clouds, to the dark lowland jungles. Thus, it was called the Empire of the Clouds. They had grown an amazing civilization by shunning their more bestial natures and adhering to a strict code of ethics rules they called the coils. While it didn't subscribe some grand religious belief, its laws allowed for the Nakatl to thrive and even tame what was a very wild and dangerous Naya. Though this is the history of Ajani's people, it's not their current status. Dark forces had already begun to manipulate the Nakatl of Naya, fearing their strength and unity. Whispers of the old ways found purchase in the ears of the violent hunting legend of the pride, Marisi. The Empire of the Clouds for generations was declining from its golden heights as the premier society that it had once been. With each passing year, the ancient texts of the coil which governed their lives became more convoluted and complicated, making it hard to understand what exactly the laws actually were. With frays beginning to appear in their society, the Empire desperately clung to power of its people by enforcing its laws with threats of violence. And that was despite their own ability to clearly decipher them. Marisi believed that the Cloud Empire had grown weak, that it was their disregard of their very natures that threatened the Nakatl. Marisi gathered supporters who shared his vision of returning to the wild and free lifestyle, removing the guise of civility in place of savagery and strength. Marisi led them into a revolution that not only shattered the ancient writings of the Coil, but the Empire of the Clouds as well. They descended from the mountains, their former homes and ruins, returning to the dark jungles of their origins. This schism within the Nakatl gave rise to two now conflicting groups, the Cloud Nakatl and the Wild Nakatl. It is in this time of turmoil that Ajani was born, a cub of the Wild Nakatl tribes. With no central government or rules propping up a single culture within the Wild Nakatl, several different tribes popped up across the lowlands of Naya, each free to act as they pleased. The Wild Nakatl of the Kazali Valley seemed to keep true to a lot of the common laws that had existed with the Cloud Nakatl. 
Thus, they were seen as more weak. But they would soon welcome in a pride mate that would go on to change the course of not only Naya's history, but the history of the multiverse. Though none welcomed him when Ajani was first born. His tribe recoiled at his appearance. Though growing into a strong and fierce hunter and warrior, Ajani's fur was snow white. He was albino, which to the Nakatl was seen as a bad omen. There was a stigma associated with the color white, especially found on one's mane. They described it as looking as white as death. Ajani was ostracized from the cattle society. Though he was permitted to live within the tribe, there were very few who would engage with him socially. Ajani in his youth tried in vain to earn the respect of his tribe, often carrying out the most dangerous hunts on some of Naya's most dangerous beasts. Great accomplishments worthy of praise, no doubt, if they had been done by any other Nakatl. It was during one of these great hunts that Ajani would lose an eye, a lasting disfigurement that paled in comparison to his striking coat color. Still, because of those superstitions, Ajani was merely tolerated, but never truly accepted. Though not much is known of Ajani's parents, he did grow up with an older brother, Jazal who chiefly looked after him in his youth and is responsible for the tribe's reluctant tolerance. Jazal, in his own right, seemed to excel at everything he did. Hunting, fighting, philosophy, ruling. He was one Nick Cattle in 10,000, a natural born leader who both understood and looked out for his people. It was no surprise to Ajani that Jazal quickly grew in prominence and eventually found himself as the new Ka, or leader, of the Quasal Valley Pride. Jazal was not some vain, power hungry figure, quite the opposite. To many, he would be considered weak and civil, preferring to think on matters rather than lash out in violence. But it was his steady grasp that led his pride to prosperity. In truth, Jazal only became Ka when it was offered, in the hopes that it would extend a greater courtesy to his brother Ajani. Jazal loved his brother, and felt that the way the pride had treated him was unnecessary. But even as Ka, Jazal's brother was still merely tolerated, and not honored as he had hoped. For years, Ajani lived in the shadows of his people, only having two others he could really rely on his brother Jazal, and the tribe's shaman, Zaliki, who befriended the close relative of the Ka. This may have been because of Ajani's unique powers and magical abilities. On top of being a fierce fighter, Ajani was adept at a most intriguing form of magic, simply known as soul magic. Ajani has an innate connection with other living beings. He can see within their souls, understand their wants, their needs, and what motivates them. He can sniff through lies and deception, looking straight into the souls of others for truth. With magic, Ajani can manipulate the energy of souls, creating constructs of individuals, rallying morale, and healing injuries. In fact, Ajani was known as his tribe's best healer because of this, but that still did nothing to mend his status as a pariah. Others begrudgingly sought out Ajani's aid like he was some sort of crazed witch, rather than a respected healer. This was Ajani's existence, and though he tried to change his fate in his youth, eventually he succumbed to the reality of this situation. Hunting, healing, being brother of the Ka, none of it did anything to earn him the respect of the tribe. Ajani began to accept his place, if not to save himself the trouble of disappointment, then for the sake of his brother. Ajani knew how much Jazal cared for him. He wanted nothing more than to at least limit the amount of issues having an albino brother could cause him. Ajani kept his head low and did little to try and change the minds of his pride mates. That was until Alara itself began to tremble. Trouble for Ajani began when his brother, in an act of stubbornness, put him on patrol with pride mates who despised him. Most notably was the warrior Tanakh, who had been a long-standing bully towards Ajani. Despite their protest, the Ka's words were final, and they began to patrol the outer reachings of the tribe's territory. What was meant to be a routine scout became anything but, as the group was ambushed by various humans out of nowhere. Humans on the Shard of Naya were even more nomadic than the wild Nakatl, people who merely fought for their own survival. A human attack on Nakatl patrols was unheard of, and certainly unexpected. 
Though they were stronger, the patrol was outnumbered. Tanakh noticed that the humans were deliberately targeting Ajani over the others. Using this to his advantage, Tanakh and the others escaped, abandoning Ajani to the assailants. Ajani fights with the heart of a champion, but there are simply just too many of them. He would have succumbed to the human's attacks if it wasn't for the timely intervention of his brother. Jazal was keeping close tabs on the patrol to ensure no trouble came to Ajani, but it seemed trouble was seeking him out specifically. Was there really a curse tied to the color of his fur as so many had suggested? As the siblings defeat the remaining humans, Jazal finds a parchment with Ajani's likeness on it. It seems there was something more than fate out to get him. Jazal promises to track down whomever was behind this attack and bring them to justice. But for now, it was time to rest and celebrate their great victory. A festive time was approaching for the Wild the Cattle, a great feast in remembrance of Marisi, the breaking of the coil, and the beginning of their pride. Jazal was a student of philosophies and fate. He had sensed for a long time that a great span of challenge was coming for his people. He looked to shield Ajani from whatever it was, but cared too for the ultimate survival of the Nakatl. In that, he thought of his people's civil war, the breaking between the wild and the cloud Nakatl. He believed this rift only served to weaken the Nakatl overall, and even reached out to envoys of the Cloud Empire to try and mend their relationship. This earned Jazal some powerful enemies from outside the Pride, those who only benefited from the continued infighting between these powerful groups. Ajani wanted to repay Jazal for his great kindness in coming to his defense. Truly, he would not be alive today without his aid. To honor his brother, Ajani went out into the Nyan Wilds to hunt a great beast and bring it back for the feast the Pride was preparing. His quarry was no small thing, but a godsire, a behemoth that trampled through the jungles, felling trees and villages alike. Its meat was delectable as it was dangerous to procure. While the hunt was a success, Ajani would still find no good fortune, as his kill would be poached by none other than Tanakh, his great rival. Tanakh brutally assaulted the exhausted Ajani, and brought back the godsire to the tribe claiming it as his own. Ajani could do nothing but limp back to the festivities, battered and bruised, keeping his injuries secret as to not ruffle the tribe's feathers on what's supposed to be a revelous day. Ajani would keep the peace as he always had, as he spent the rest of the feast alone, watching others enjoy his prize. As he examined the festivities carefully, Ajani noticed the tribe's shaman, Zaliki, wander off. They seemed to be almost skulking about the camp, Ajani followed Zaliki into the dwelling of the Ka, his brother's lair. He caught Zaliki inscribing Ajani's likeness on Jazal's wall, in the same manner that was found with the human attackers. Zaliki then flees as Ajani is stunned at this revelation. He's unable to meet with Jazal before the feast ends and the tribe retreats to sleep off the festivities. Ajani, having not seen Zaliki since, remains wary that evening, keeping watch over the tribe, looking out for any signs of trouble. As was so often in Ajani's life, trouble would find him, as a mysteriously cloaked figure approached the fire blazing near the center of the village. He only makes out the shadowy figure mumbling some sort of apology before dropping a vessel of dark magic into the flames. From the campfire sprung out shades of fiends that Ajani couldn't begin to describe. They were like living shadows or demons who acted upon the will of whomever summoned them. With swords and daggers made from night itself, they spread throughout the camp like an eclipse. They attacked each Nakatl they came upon, leaving no room for mercy in their attack. While some were slain in their sleep, others were alerted by the screams of the fallen and attempted to mount a defense. The cattle claws and weapons swung through the shadows with little effect. Ajani, using his magic, had much better results against the nightmarish assailants, but his efforts couldn't save the entire pride so he instead focused on saving those he could. In his fervent defense of the pride, Ajani had neglected to check on Jazal's dwelling, and by the time he reached it, he was too late. Bursting in, Ajani is flooded with emotions as he finds his brother killed, slaughtered in his bed. Ajani rushes to his side, but knows the truth the moment his paw touches Jazal's now cooling skin. In this moment of great pain at losing the one person who cared for him, Ajani's emotions swell. A mixture of sadness and anger coursed through his soul, powerful feelings that fuel something deep within him into a raging inferno. A spark is lit, 
as the body of Jazal and the blood splattered walls around him fade into nothing, a Johnny Goldmane planeswalks for the first time. When he opened his eyes again, he found he was no longer in a place he recognized. It was a lush forest like Naya, but at the same time, not Naya. Confused, he wandered this new land trying to make sense of everything that had happened. Had he been killed too? Was this some sort of afterlife? If it was, Ajani found no luck here either. As he was attacked by a large, winged creature he could not put a name to, its kind did not exist back on Naya. It was a dragon, but no ordinary dragon. This one was called Karthus, given the title the Tyrant of Jund. Ajani would have had little hopes in combating such a strange creature. Lucky for him, another brave warrior stood up in his defense. The man commanded the dragon to back down, with a voice as booming as the shifting mountains around them. He claimed that Ajani was his kill, and the dragon had no right to it. Karthus believed what Ajani hoped was a lie, and flew off. His savior introduced himself as Sarkon Val, and realized immediately that Ajani wasn't a native of Jund. He explained that they were both planeswalkers, beings with the unique ability to jump between planes of existence, to explore the vast multiverse, to traverse different worlds. He had completed his very first planeswalk. He was now on the shard plane of Jund, a neighboring world close to Naya. Sarkon Vol acted as a mentor, teaching the new planeswalker about his abilities and how to use his memories and instincts to guide him through the blind eternities. Ajani shared with Sarkon his own tale of woe and how he now seeks vengeance. In his parting words, Sarkon told Ajani to embrace anger, to let it fuel his desire for retribution. Rage is a powerful tool for those who can control it, and with that, Ajani was shown how to return to Naya as he continued his search for Jazal's murderer. Ajani makes his way back to his former village, now in tatters and ruin. He begins his investigation by searching for clues in Jazal's dwelling. While he didn't find much aside from bloodstains, he did recover the weapon his brother so often used to defend him. The jet black obsidian axe head stood in stark contrast with Ajani's own nearly bone white blade. He removed the head from its hilt and lashed it firmly to the bottom of his own axe. He now wields a deadly double bladed axe a potent weapon that stands as a constant reminder of what he is fighting for, the search for vengeance, as well as championing the life Jazal fought for his people. He made his resolve known by finding the now cremated body of his brother and painting his body with the ashes. Setting out, Ajani had two primary suspects, the shaman Zaliki and the despicable Tanakh. He confronted Tanakh first, feeling emboldened to exact revenge for everything this rival had done to him. Rage built up as the two met near a cliff and immediately began arguing. While Tanakh admitted he respected Ajani, he admitted he had nothing to do with that terrible night or the dark artifact dropped into the fire. Ajani, consumed by his anger, grabbed Tanakh by the throat and dangled him over the cliffside, trying to extract any information he could. Unfortunately, Ajani slipped, causing both of the Nakatl to fall. Tanakh managed to grab onto some roots, but Ajani fell the entire distance, crashing hard onto the jungle floor below. Broken, Ajani could do nothing but fade from Naya and back into the blind eternities, almost like a reflex. Without knowing where his planeswalker spark would take him, an unconscious Ajani finally wakes up on a world full of light, bright colors flooding his one good eye. He finds that he's being attended to by what looks like to be a human shaman. In reality, it's the healing hands of another planeswalker, a woman who introduces herself as Elspeth Terrell. Aside from her exceptional kindness, Ajani feels a deep sadness within Elspeth, and something else that inherently connects their very souls. She's a planeswalker like himself, and like Ajani, she's not a native of this world, a plane she calls Bant. Another shard of what used to be Alara, now just a floating neighbor in the blind eternities. Ajani thanks Elspeth for healing him, and warned her of a coming trouble that seemed to be tying the shards of Alara together, before vanishing off back to Naya to finish what he had started. Not yet satisfied with Tanakh, Ajani again tracks down his former rival. This time, however, he learns that Tanakh and others had been again listening to the commands of Marisi, the legendary Nakatl who first started the civil war between their people. His revolutionary ideas had become more extreme, as war efforts between the Wild and Cloud Nakatl only seemed to intensify. 
It started to make sense. Jazal was reaching out the arm of peace to the Cloud Nacatl, something that could upend the entire rebellion and put them all under the Empire of Clouds' oppressive rules. That must have been the reason behind his assassination. Ajani tracked down Marisi and confronted the living legend, but to his surprise, the attack on their tribe was not done simply for his rebellion. There was something much deeper going on. Marisi's revolution had been co-opted by an unknown force, a shadow disguising themselves in his image, using his own voice against his cause. This force manipulated Tanakh and the humans into attacking Ajani, and convinced the shaman Zaliki to launch the fiendish attack that resulted in Jazal's death. Though Marisi wanted to fight and defend the wild Nakatl's way of life, attacking his own people to achieve this was counterproductive. It weakened them as a whole. The only information Marisi could give Ajani was a name. The name of a dragon. A creature of massive size and cunning to match. Nicobolus. A name that would go on to plague the rest of Ajani's story. Ajani took this information and planeswalked to the only place he knew where to find dragons, the Shard of Jund. But as he tried to fade into the blind eternities and reach Jund, he found he couldn't. It dawned on him like a feeling deep within his soul, as he felt the very soil beneath his feet begin to flood with immense traces of mana, mana not native to Naya, mana he had felt on both Jund and Bant. The shards that were once Alara were again joining together, bringing about a totally new world order no one was prepared for. Shining Knights of Bant would come face to face with the wild and savage jungles of Naya, while the tyrannical powers of the Jun Dragons would be challenged by the inescapable death produced by the Shard of Grixis. The event known as the Conflux had begun. As the world churned, Ajani managed to at least planeswalk to the newly emerged section of Alar that was once Jund. He didn't manage to find his former mentor Sarkon Vol, but he ran into a human shaman named Kresh of Clan Neltoth. The two discussed the devastation that was befalling both of their shards, with Kresh explaining how his people had been manipulated by the dragon Nicobolus and his pawn, the draconic shaman Sarkon Vol. It was their machinations that resulted in all the ills that had taken place in Ajani's life. Kresh explains how another agent of Bolas, Rakamar, had led their clan to ruin in service of the dragon, who was now siphoning the mana from Jund itself. They could only hypothesize that this was Bolas' goal with all of the shards. As Sarkon and Raka abandoned Kresh and his clan to die at the hands of the dragons they controlled, Ajani intervened and used his inspirational magic to rally Kresh and his shamans to mount a defense. Working together, the pair made their way to the border of Grixis, where they had heard reports of Nicol Bolas residing, now with an army from Jun at their backs. As if by fate, Ajani would meet a former friend there on this desolate scrap of land separating worlds from the Aether. It was his tribe's shaman, Zaliki. They admitted that it was true, that they were responsible for Jazal's death. Only after being manipulated by Nicobolus, whose only goal throughout all of this chaos was to stoke fear and division, leading to as much conflict and war as possible. Bolus had planned for any number of complications to his plans, but with the denizens of the shards fighting others and amongst themselves, the dragon believed there was no standing force that could stop him. Ajani's search for vengeance was over. There was no one person he could blame for the loss of his brother. It was all a web of lies and deceit from an otherworldly foe none of them could prepare for. The final one who could sate his desire for vengeance. As the Dragon Planeswalker makes this moment the moment where he appears to all for the first time. Addressing the ragtag armies of Jund, Bant, and Naya that had assembled in an ill-fated attempt to stop him. Nicobolus is a vain creature, Ajani suspected he delighted in the audience. They all watched as the flows of mana that was fusing Alara together were refocused and drawn towards Nicobolus. He was feeding from it, growing both in size and in power. Ajani could feel it. He was ascending into some other state of being. Rage bolted from Ajani as he reached deep within himself for the magic that could stop Bolus. It was something the dragon had not planned for, a power he didn't take into consideration when he ordered the attacks on the Nakatl. It was the soul magic that so blessed his people that would be all of Alara's savior. 
Ajani felt the flow of mana coming from everyone near the conflux rushing in the bolus and severed its ties, cutting off the drip of power Bolus was feeding from. He then directed the mana into himself. Bolus had already consumed a great deal of the powerful essence already, meaning he had almost achieved his goal of ultimate magical power before this. What Ajani transferred to himself paled in comparison, but it was enough to conjure something much larger than he had ever done before. A soul effigy, the living embodiment of the dragon planeswalker's soul. Bolus was surprised by this development, something that had rarely happened in the dragon's extremely long life. The avatar lashed out at him in perfect synchronization, attacking him in the exact same manner in which he would attack an adversary. As this was his own soul made into a physical construct, there would be no real winner in this fight. But Ajani didn't need to defeat Bolus here and now, he just needed Bolus to not win. As Bolus fought with himself, he and the effigy both opened their jaws wide and bit down on each other's necks at the same time. This release of pressure exploded in a blast of white light. The conflux was complete, Alara was reformed, and Nicol Bolas was nowhere to be seen. While the maelstrom of mana settled at the center of the shards, solidifying Alara's reunion, Bolas was left to planeswalk away to recover from his injuries, both those to his body and those to his ego. How could a simple mortal, even a planeswalker, have disrupted his machinations, centuries in the making? It was his goal to regain the godlike powers he had lost during the Mending, which weakened the magic of all planeswalkers, and the maelstrom of mana at the center of Alara was meant to do just that. Instead, his scheme was foiled by just the intervention of a single Leonin. Now, with all of his future plans, the dragon would account for a Johnny Goldmane and ensure he would never again foil his ascension, a special condition that Bolas had never had to consider before. Though he had stopped Bolas, the damage of the Conflux had already taken its toll on Alara. These separate shards had denizens on them that have never experienced interacting with these various peoples and cultures. There would be war, power struggles, and a great many changes as they all start to live in this new shared world. Although Ajani had returned to Naya and his tribe, he felt no true sense of accomplishment. He felt like his fight wasn't over yet. Not his fight against Bolas, but his fight against Injustice. His fight to defend the weak, just as his brother had done. As a planeswalker, he felt bound to leave Alara, to leave his tribe, and help others throughout the multiverse. And that's exactly what he does. Though he had finally earned the respect of the Pride, with them even offering Ajani the title of Ka, he turned them down. He left them in the capable hands of Zaliki, who would become their new leader in the most challenging of times. Ajani didn't know where to begin as he leapt through the Blind Eternities, at first just jumping from random plane to random plane, learning what he could of the different people he encountered on his journey. Wherever he went, he always inspired others to be the best they could be, and was there to offer just the right words to those in need of them. But soon, he reflected on his own debts that he needed to repay. Ajani's mind wanders to the memory of his healer on Bant, Elspeth Terrell, he never did properly thank her for that act of kindness, so he again jumps through the blind eternities, looking for the one who had saved his life. When Ajani tracked down Elspeth, he found the errant knight in a far worse place than their last encounter, both physically and emotionally. After the fall of her beloved shard Bant and its fate to be consumed by the demons and undead of Grixis following the conflux, Elspeth flew into a spiraling depression. Bant was her home, a place she felt like she belonged, and like everything else she had loved in her life, it was taken from her. Ajani could sense Elspeth had a great hidden pain she kept, not only from him, but herself, something she was not yet ready to share. Ajani reunited with Elspeth as she participated in gladiatorial bouts for money in the fighting pits of Urborg on the plain of Dominaria. He even had to intervene before Elspeth, who was enraged, almost landed a death blow on a fellow planeswalking combatant. Luckily, Ajani managed to pull her back to her senses and stop this senseless brawl. Though he had saved Elspeth here on Dominaria, there was little he could do to aid her emotional healing. Ajani tried to convince her there was so much more she could do back on Alara, fighting for Bant. But Elspeth simply believed Bant was already gone, and hopelessness had taken her. All Ajani could do was return her knightly armor that she had left on Bant, 
and leave the wounded warrior to find her own way out of this darkness. Though her sadness played heavily on Ajani's soul, Still, he feared for her and the self-destructive path she was heading down, and after a while of giving her space, he again tracked Elspeth to check up on her. This time, he followed her to the plain of Theros, a world Ajani was familiar with as he had traveled there before after Alara had reformed. When he first arrived, he sought out the plain's native Leonin inhabitants, feeling a sense of kinship with this group despite them being from different worlds. He quickly befriended a powerful warrior among them named Bramaz, whom he returned to seeking help in tracking down Elspeth. To his surprise, Bramaz had risen to a prominent position within the Therosan Prides, acting as his kin's king, or in better terms, their speaker to the rest of the plane. With his newfound resources, Bramaz was more than willing to lend Ajani aid in his search for Elspeth, and while his retainers were out looking for her, he sat his old friend down to fill him in on what's been happening on Theros in his absence. A lot had transpired over the years since he left, and a lot tied back to his friend Elspeth. Bramaz told the tale of a hero who came crashing down from the heavens, someone not of Theros, but still chosen by the plane's pantheon of gods as their champion. This was Elspeth. The god of the sun, the chief deity of the pantheon, Heliod, had chosen Elspeth to be his champion, as a usurper skulked in the shadows looking to upend the gods who sat in the realm of Nyx. Elspeth was now at the center of this growing godly conflict, and she needed guidance, a mentor, a friend. Bramaz's agents were successful in finding Elspeth, and soon the two were reunited, embracing each other and feeling a true kinship both had longed for. Ajani again felt great sadness and worry in Elspeth's soul, something she still clung to but didn't want to reveal. Ajani didn't pressure her, but simply stated that he was there for her, and would follow her where she led. This journey would take the pair to the very edges of Theros' mortal realm, the Horizon of Nyx, Realm of the Gods, as they must confront a being known as Xenagos. He had once been a planeswalker like them, but through manipulations and the unwitting aid of Elspeth, he had done the seemingly impossible and ascended to godhood. Heliod, Elspeth's idol of worship, saw Xenagos as a stain on Nyx, and commanded his champion to remove this would-be usurper. That was her, and now Ajani's, mission. The pair set sail seeking Crufix, the god of the edge of the world, the guardian of the veil between the mortal realm and Nyx. To get there, they sought out a famous mariner, Calife, who was rumored to have sailed into Nyx itself. Through legends, they found an old drownyard of broken ships, and there was Calife. She whispered an incantation, and from the wreckage rose her ship, the Monsoon, as she agreed to ferry them to Nyx. However, this was all a ruse. Calife was actually the planeswalker Kiora, who had come to Theros seeking her own prize. She used the travelers to face off against Thassa, god of the sea, but this wasn't their arrangement. In the end, Thassa sent the champions of Heliod off on their mission, then engaged with the lying trickster merfolk. Elspeth and Ajani had made it to the Temple of Mystery, the place of worship for Crufix, god of horizons, who grants them safe passage into Nyx in order to face off against Xanagos. However, for a mortal to step into Nyx required more than just Crufix's permission. One of them must undergo a trial of the gods, with each testing the individual in unique and sometimes terrifying ways, all to ensure their worthiness before mingling with the gods. The gods were still foreign to them, they didn't know all of them or what their ordeals could mean. As champions of Heliod, they were barred from undergoing his ordeal. Ajani pleaded with Elspeth to take on Thassa's ordeal, seeing how she had already proven herself an ally to their cause. But to his amazement and confusion, she opted to take on the ordeal of Erebos, god of death. Erebos' ordeal saw the pair wade through Elspeth's greatest fears a nightmare she had lived once before and struggled with even now. Ajani watched as his friend was tormented by images of her past, of beings called Phyrexians, tearing apart her friends, her loved ones, her family. They imprisoned her, and soon she would have become one of these monsters if not for her planeswalker spark igniting and flinging her to safety. Those others of her home plane weren't so lucky. Ajani now understood why Elspeth felt so much despair at Bant's fate. It was yet another home taken from her by dark forces. 
With Ajani's magic and encouragement, Elspeth conquered her old fears and passed the ordeal, giving them both access to Nyx and leading them to the finality of their journey. In revealing more of her past, Elspeth admits that she comes from a plane that was overtaken by Phyrexia, that she could do nothing to save her loved ones, and now did everything in her power to right wrongs and protect those who cannot fight for themselves. That's what she was doing here on Theros, trying to right a wrong she believed she caused in the rise of Xenagos, though she was merely an unwitting pawn in his scheme. Elspeth discussed her failed attempts to free another world, Mirrodin, from the grasp of Phyrexia, but failed. This world she could not save was now known as New Phyrexia. Her failures almost crushed her, but Ajani always had an encouraging word and a calming presence to will anyone forward. For now, they had to fight the enemy right in front of them, Xenagos. The would-be god was not hard to spot. Although the satyr had become somewhat divine, his being remained unstable in Nyx, as if the starry sky was trying to reject him. This is why he didn't have the absolute power the other gods did, and how Elspeth and Ajani were able to trade blows with such a powerful figure. Their battle lasted hours, possibly days, with each taking devastating hits. In the end, it was Elspeth who was victorious, as her specially crafted godly weapon, God's End, slashed through Xenagos' chest, causing him to crash down back to the mortal plane. The battle was won, but not without a cost. Elspeth was injured and Ajani was exhausted from the effort, and still more ominous news came from Nylia, god of the hunt, who sought mercy for these heroes. She warned them that both Erebos and Heliod were coming to claim Elspeth, that they had to leave Nyx as soon as possible. They raced to the edge of the horizon, only to be stopped by the god of the sun, Heliod, Elspeth's god. Rather than rewarding his champion for a job well done, he took God's End and stabs Elspeth with it, mortally wounding her. The god's vanity was wounded, that beings like Elspeth, these planeswalkers, could hold power over their dominion. He would not allow her to share in his power. Ajani could do nothing but hold his friend close and get her back to the mortal realm before she finally died. Ajani was successful in this, holding Elspeth close as she breathed for the last time, taking in the crisp air of Theros. He watched through tearful eyes the agents of Erebos coming to claim her soul for the underworld. Ajani, tired, stood up and prepared to fight them off, to defend the body of his friend, but he was pulled away by Bramaz, protecting Ajani from himself. Elspeth descends into the underworld, her body was gone, but her soul continued to live on. The last thing Ajani took was Elspeth's white cloak, wrapping it around his neck, a constant reminder of someone special he had lost. Before leaving Theros, Ajani performed one final duty in Elspeth's name. He had learned a great deal in his journey through this plane and its realm of gods. Krufix and Xenagos, as well as Heliod's own actions, had revealed to him the truth of their divinity. Gods on Theros are created by the beliefs of the mortals below. They do not exist as a constant. They claim to have dominion over the mortals below them, but they exist only because said mortals believe in them. Without their faith, they are nothing. He spread this message far and wide through each of the great temples of Theros. Namely, he targeted the followers of Heliod, telling all of how he murdered his own champion and how he was not fit to be honored or worshiped. After doing this for some time, he felt confident that his words of doubt would take hold in the populace and over time, topple Heliod. With Elspeth's cloak worn to honor her memory, Ajani leaves Theros behind. Ajani mourned the loss of his friend. He felt a deep connection between their souls, and with her gone, the Leonin almost fell into despair. Luckily, through his many adventurous planeswalking, he made allies whom he could rely on during troubled times. He sought out the compassion of the planeswalker Tamio, who he met while visiting her home plane of Kamigawa. She was a collector of stories, legends, and lore. Tamio admired Ajani's pursuit of true justice throughout the multiverse and hopes to include him in a number of tomes accounting valor. Ajani hoped Tamio could spread the deeds of Elspeth across the multiverse, honoring and keeping her memory alive. In discussion, Tamio mentions a scheming planeswalker who had also visited Kamigawa, a man cast in metal named Tezzeret. 
He was running some sort of smuggling enterprise throughout the multiverse, and stole some intriguing artifacts to add to the growing collection within his infinite consortium. The name Tezzeret was familiar to Ajani. Elspeth said she had encountered the Planeswalker when she attacked New Phyrexia. His purpose on New Phyrexia was unknown, but he was clearly not an ally of their resistance. This Tezzeret person was not good news, and if not for others in the multiverse, Ajani set out to find this planeswalker and bring him to justice for his lost friend. He leaves Tamiyo and heads to Tezzeret's last known location, the Plain of Kaladesh. On Kaladesh, a world of miraculous mechanical marvels, Ajani found the plane stoked with tension and division. The local populace were being taken advantage of by a strict governmental force centered around someone known as the Head Judge, who Ajani quickly discovered was Tezzeret. He had taken control over the plane's center of technological wonders, tightening his grasp over citizens and talented inventors. He wasn't aware of the totality of his schemes, and how Tezzeret was working for his greatest enemy, Nicol Bolas, but what Ajani had always stood for was to free people from oppression and he decided to do just that for the people of Kaladesh. With no known allies on the plane, Ajani quickly went to work aligning himself with the local resistance which referred to themselves as Renegades. They acted as smugglers mostly, moving around a material known as Aether, which was the fuel source for many commoners' fantastic machines and research efforts. Tezzeret's government had been greatly restricting Aether's availability to everyday inventors, hoarding the majority of it for whatever he was working on. Whatever that device was, surely it wouldn't bode well for the multiverse. Ajani didn't take a prominent or public role with the Renegades, choosing to support them from the shadows while gathering information on Tezzeret. Yet, he needed to do more for this cause, as their leader, the Renegade Prime, Pia Nalar, had been captured and sentenced to a deadly duel against Tezzeret himself. Not only that, but other important Renegade members were being held captive under suspicions of disobedience, and were likely to be executed. Ajani personally saw to freeing these Renegades, which just so happened to include the Planeswalkers, Chandra Nalar, and Nissa Ravane. Thus was Ajani Goldmane's introduction to the interplanar band of heroes known as the Gatewatch. After freeing the Planeswalkers and other Renegades, focus shifted to aiding Pia Nalar, the head of the movement as well as Chandra's mother, who would surely perish in a one-on-one -on -one fight against Tezzeret. Tezzeret looking to soak in his own vanity and put down rebellion all in one fell swoop was probably all too happy for the contest to begin. It was true, Pia was losing, but luckily, before the mortal blow was struck, the Gatewatch arrived with Ajani reinforcing their shocking entrance into the arena. Their sudden appearance caused chaos, Tezzeret fled and initiated a consulate crackdown, Aether production was halted, and great inventions along with their inventors were taken into custody. It was his final gambit, attempting to buy as much time as possible to complete his grand project. Ajani would go on to support the Renegade forces on the ground against the mobilized agents of Tezzeret's consulate, while the Gatewatch formulated a plan to bring down Tezzeret. Thanks to the ingenuity of Chandra, Gideon, and Liliana, their enemy was delayed enough for the former to drive an airship right into the Grand Invention, a giant interplanar portal machine known as the Planar Bridge. Unfortunately, in the ensuing chaos of the wreckage, Tezzeret managed to snag the inner core of the device and implant it into his own inorganic chest and escaped. But for Kaladesh, his reign of terror had come to an end. Ajani met with the Gatewatch after this minor victory, understanding the true depths of what had just happened. The Gatewatch explained that they knew Tezzeret as an agent of Nicol Bolas, and that the device he was working on was to be used in the dragon's machinations. Ajani was no stranger to Bolas, and knew him to be the multiverse's greatest tyrant, one he would stop as many times as it took to keep people safe from his rule. Without hesitation, Ajani joined the Gatewatch when they extended him an invitation feeling honored and like a part of him was finally accepted into a pride all his own. With a smile on his face, he proudly recited his oath to keep watch, to protect the innocent from tyrants, and helping all find their place in the multiverse. While planeswalkers like Liliana Vess had worked alongside the dragon and witnessed glimpses of his power, Ajani was the only member of the Gatewatch who had actually stood against the dragon. He won that fight on Alara, but that was before. He can now be calculated into the dragon's plans. He wouldn't get that lucky again. 
Still, he provided great insight to the immense power of Bolas, and how he wasn't some small threat. And certainly, even with their combined might, they wouldn't be enough to face Bolas directly. They needed more allies. He cautioned the Gatewatch on acting with too much haste, but they didn't listen. Ajani told them to meet him on the plane of Dominaria, where he knew many potential allies he could recruit in their fight against Bolas. As he left, the other members chose to instead to go to Amonkhet, after Tezzeret revealed the location of Bolas. Determined to stop the dragon before his plans advanced any further, they leave Ajani to his mission of recruiting others in case they were to fail. And fail they do. Ajani knew there was a larger conflict just on the horizon, a war that would test not only the Gatewatch's resolve, but risk the very freedom of the multiverse. While members of the Gatewatch foolishly took on Nicol Bolas at the place he was strongest, Amonkhet, the world he subjugated and converted into a personal army factory, Ajani travels to Dominaria to shore up allies in the coming fight against the Dragon Planeswalker. Ajani knew Dominaria to be a hotbed for Planeswalkers to visit, with some of the greatest heroes of the multiverse having spent at least some time here. While we don't know much about his recruitment efforts, we do know that he met and adventured with Joyra and the new Weatherlight crew across the plain. After being soundly defeated by Bolas on Amonkhet, Gideon and Liliana travel to Dominaria to heal their injuries and rendezvous with their wiser companion. Here they explain their next steps to fight against Bolas. The mission was twofold to acquire an artifact known as the Blackblade, which was rumored to contain dark magic capable of slaying Elder Dragons, and to kill the demon lord Belzenlock, the final vestige of Liliana's contract over her soul. With all her other demon lords slain, the death of Belzenlock would free the necromancer from this corrupt bargain orchestrated by Bolas, allowing her to freely strike back at her former broker. Ajani wouldn't accompany the pair on this quest, but Joyra and the Weatherlight crew would assist them in these efforts. Ajani decided to instead continue on with his recruiting of other planeswalkers to their cause, hoping that with numbers and possibly other unknown planeswalkers to Bolas, they could recreate the same variables that led to his original victory on Alara. He planeswalks away confident in both his and the Gatewatch's success. The dawn of the war was upon them, as the Gatewatch hears rumblings that Bolas was set to move on the plain of Ravnica which some believe is a nearly focal fixture of the multiverse. Already, Ravnica had been systematically weakened in preparation of Bolas's invasion. The sanctity of its ten guilds had been corrupted thanks to Agents of the Dragon, and it was just about time to start the initial assault on the plain. But the true machinations of Bolas wouldn't be known to Ajani or the others until it was all laid bare upon the rubble that was Ravnica. Ajani himself feels an irresistible pull to planeswalk to Ravnica, like a siren's call speaking directly to his soul, urging his spark to leap through the nothingness to this one singular plane. While he tries to resist this, he quickly succumbs to whatever this magic was and finds himself on Ravnica. To his surprise, his fellow Gatewatch members are also forcibly pulled on the Ravnica along with an army of other planeswalkers, both known and unknown to him. Had his recruitment campaign worked? The sounds of screams and explosions seemed to signal this all had been a part of the dragon's scheme. What dragged Ajani and the other planeswalkers to Ravnica was a device known as the Interplanar Beacon, a machine built by the Izzet unknowingly under Bolas's specific instructions. Its magic glowed like a lightning bug through the darkness of the blind eternities, ushering in every spark who sensed it. The plan became more clear as Ajani, no matter how hard he tried, couldn't planeswalk away from Ravnica. It was like someone had dampened his spark, all of their sparks. Again, this was Bolas, whose use of the Immortal Sun artifact prevented planeswalking away from Ravnica. This was his plan, to draw in countless planeswalkers and trap them on Ravnica. But why? That revelation came again through screams and bloodshed. Tezzeret's planar bridge opened up a great portal from Ravnica to Amonkhet, where through Bolas's vast army of undead eternals forged from the plains people marched. They killed everyone in their sights, any and all who resisted. When an eternal met with a planeswalker, a mere grasp was all it took for the zombies to rip free that planeswalker's soul, their spark. The night sky of Ravnica lit up with the siphoned sparks of planeswalkers glistening like wisps, all flying towards one central location, Nicol Bolas. 
he was consuming the sparks of planeswalkers, surely in an attempt to regain his godlike powers as he had tried so many years ago on Alara. Ajani had stopped him then, but feared this time was different. He would not be able to defeat Bolas alone once again. The dragon had planned for Ajani's involvement from the beginning of this. There would be no surprise gambit. This fight would be different though from the last. Ajani can't win alone, but he too now had allies, and fighting alongside others had always been the Leonin's greatest strength. Ajani's role in this fight was granting great boons to his fellow planeswalkers. Like in his original confrontation with Bolas, Ajani used his soul magic to make effigies to combat his evil dreadhorde. He used the energy of his allies' souls to make mirror images to aid them in the battle. Ajani did this for himself as well, but rather than summoning a physical construct of his soul, he made effigies of his long-lost companions, his pride mates, and friends from both Naya and Theros. It brought him great comfort to be fighting alongside those closest to him, even if they were just his memory of them. He also used his soul magic to invigorate and inspire his fellow planeswalkers. Many had been brought here and trapped against their wills. Many had never been in a true fight for their lives before. And all of a sudden, they were surrounded by death. Ajani's encouraging presence filled them with courage and boosted their morale, leading to numerous rallying cries and a strength many of the planeswalkers had not known they possessed. As he and others survived the initial attack, Ajani met with the Gatewatch and the leaders of Ravnica to calculate some sort of counterattack that could stop Bolas' ultimate ascension. If he is left to succeed, he would become nearly godlike in his powers, and would easily dominate his will over the multiverse. This fate must be stopped. Here, Ajani meets with a new ally, the artificial planeswalker Karn, who wasn't a direct member of the Gatewatch, but had agreed to help them defeat Bolas. He mentions that, prior to this, he was looking for means to stop a growing Phyrexian threat on New Phyrexia. This caught Ajani's attention, as he too was interested in ending New Phyrexia, which were the ultimate enemies of his lost friend Elspeth. But for now, they needed to face the tyrant in front of them. Their plan now was to split up and take away sections of Bolas' plan piece by piece, until he was weak enough to confront directly. Ajani was placed on a group with fellow planeswalkers Watli, Jiang, and Mu Yanling. Their specific task was to help the citizens of Ravnica and to limit collateral damage as much as possible. They teamed up with Vraska and the Golgari Swarm, a guild of Ravnica, to shepherd people into the tunnels underneath the city's streets. Through their efforts, countless Ravnican lives were saved from the brutality of what would become known as the War of the Spark. As other teams succeeded in their missions, the Immortal Sun and Interplanar Beacons would be shut off, meaning unwilling planeswalkers could now escape with their lives. While Ajani could have left there and then, preserving his own life, it was never an option for him. He would see this fight through, to ensure no others would be put under the heel of Bolas. Nicol Bolas would eventually be defeated, this time by his companions in the Gatewatch rather than by his hand directly. Ajani would join them in the plane-wide celebration, feeling a sense of pride in the defeat of the greatest enemy he had ever faced. The would-be tyrant who tried to destroy Naya from within was now gone for good. But just because one tyrant was slain, that didn't mean the multiverse was truly free. Even now, oppressive forces like the Phyrexians were boiling over and looking to extend their rule over others. For his love of Elspeth, Ajani meets with Karn to discuss a plan to eradicate New Phyrexia once and for all. With Bolas no longer a threat, Ajani meets with Karn back on Dominaria to discuss his plans to attack New Phyrexia. Elspeth, who had suffered under the rule of these monsters on her home plane, told of the horrors they would inflict on people, forcing them all to change into Phyrexians themselves, removing any sense of individuality or free will. Though Elspeth was gone, Ajani felt it his personal mission to see to the end of the Phyrexians, seeing it as the best way to honor his friend. Luckily, Karn had done some extensive research on the Phyrexian threat. He understood how powerful they could grow should they leave New Phyrexia, and he admits that he's responsible for the formation of New Phyrexia. With this burden, Karn believes it's his duty to end them. While Ajani believed Elspeth to be dead on Theros, he didn't fully understand what being dead on Theros meant. Elspeth's soul lingered in the plane's underworld until the god of death, Erebos, allowed her to return to the realm of the living. As she breathed life in once more, her spark carries her to Dominaria, where she meets again with an old friend, who is both shocked and confused to see her alive. 
Elspeth has sought out Ajani to join them in ending New Phyrexia. For countless years, she had been tormented by their nightmares, and too many worlds had suffered as she does now. Together, they will see to their defeat, ensuring no others would be put through what she had. As a gift of sorts, Ajani shared with Elspeth some interesting developments. In researching ways to beat the Phyrexians, he and Karn uncovered the name of her home plane. Better still, the fact that it had somehow survived its run-in with Phyrexians, a fate few planes can boast. Elspeth was happy to hear her home, called New Capanna, had survived, but returning there would be too hard for her, she believed. With a simple gesture, a reassuring hand on the shoulder, Ajani filled Elspeth with confidence and a great drive. She would return to New Capanna and discover the secrets to their survival. Maybe in finding that, they can also find a means to end the Phyrexians for good. While Elspeth left for New Capenna, Ajani stayed on Dominaria to track down unusual signs of Phyrexian activity on the plane. He again meets up with Joyra and the Weatherlight crew, who, if the Phyrexians were on Dominaria, would be crucial in defending the plane. While the reports of sleeper agents had spread far and wide, finding any verifiable case was difficult. Sleeper agents of New Phyrexia were essentially indiscernible from the general populace, with their plans never brought to light until it was too late. Their mission was to destabilize Dominaria, making it easier for Phyrexian invasion, as they too were now using a conscripted Tezzeret to ferry troops through the multiverse using his planar bridge. Though they targeted other planes for strategic purposes in pursuit of loftier goals, Dominaria was always Phyrexia's most desired world to complete, to bring into the Phyrexian hive mind. It was the plane most desired by their progenitor, Yagmoth, and since then, they've been drawn to Dominaria and are duty bound to complete it specifically. To prevent this, Ajani did what he does best help shore up alliances of willing forces to help combat the coming Phyrexians. Sadly, diplomacy on Dominaria had always been a complicated affair, and it took more than a kind word from Ajani to bring people together. Still, Ajani, the Time Age Tefiri, and others of the Gatewatch gathered together forces of Keldon and Benalia to help broker a peace agreement, hoping the Phyrexians wouldn't find a divided Dominaria. At this meeting, Ajani is met with devastating news. Tefiri had discovered the Phyrexians had perfected a process that could complete Planeswalkers, which before was an impossible feat. Worse still, the Planeswalker used in this initial Phyrexian experiment was his friend, Tamio, the first of many casualties in this coming war. At this same peace summit, the true depths of New Phyrexia's infiltration revealed itself as many of the Benalish representatives twisted and contorted their bodies into obscene monstrosities. They were Phyrexians. They attacked the summit goers, lashing out with pointed spines and dripping black, infectious oil. The Gatewatch fought valiantly and pushed the sleeper agents into a retreat, some bursting through a window. Ajani broke with Karn and the group and pursued those Phyrexians running away. He jumped from building to building looking for his quarry, but the Phyrexians were much more elusive than he imagined. He couldn't sense them in the cold dark, but this was all part of their plan, separating planeswalkers from their allies. Ajani was captured, and he too would be completed. Ajani was now a Phyrexian. While he initially resisted his sleeper agent programming, his values quickly came to align with Phyrexia's. He felt as though finally welcomed into a pride, a longing he had since his banishment from his own, and came to see teamwork as an alignment of perspectives. Hating differences, he longs to welcome his friends into his new family. In the completion process, Ajani's soul and spark were drenched in glistening oil, the substance that corrupts the will of the individual and twists them to serve the Phyrexian hive mind. The changes weren't just contained below his skin, though. Parts of his mortal body were replaced with machinery. Organs, bones, even skin were converted by artificy to make a more perfect Phyrexian. Still, a completed Ajani had a more important role to play in New Phyrexia's invasion efforts. His affliction was covered up with falsities, as he was to be their planeswalking sleeper agent. Ajani, though serving New Phyrexia, would play the role of heroic Gatewatch member in an effort to swart their defense of Dominaria. He rejoined his colleagues with none the wiser. Ajani seemed normal, all things considered, admitting he could not catch up with the fleeing Phyrexians. There was no change in his demeanor or memory. To everyone, he was simply Ajani. But as they planned for the defense of Dominaria, 
Ajani was taking notes and relaying them back to the hive mind, back to their grand leader, the mother of machines, Elish Norn. She was leading the invasion through the Praetor Shieldred, who now would be unstoppable with this gathered intel. As Shieldred made her appearance known at the Battle of the Mana Rig, Ajani's true loyalties too showed itself. He betrays his friends to the horror of all by killing the pyromancing planeswalker Jaya Ballard, and unceremoniously throwing her body off a cliff. His mission was to capture Karn and the artifact he possessed, called the Golgothian Silex, an ancient device that was used in the past to defeat the Phyrexians. Ajani's surprise turn took everyone off guard. The completed Leonin easily made his way through the other members of the Gatewatch, who pulled their punches now aimed at a friend. He defeats Karn in a fight and crushed the Silex with his mechanically enhanced hands. The battered Karn is then captured and carried off by the Phyrexians as Ajani too makes his escape. Ajani would again have his loyalty tested as the completed agent is sent after Tefiri to stop him from dabbling in experiments involving time. Elish Norn wasn't aware of the extents or purpose of these experiments, but it was clearly in an effort to stop their glorious invasion. Ajani at this point joined the Machine Orthodoxy, the specific faction of New Phyrexia under Elish Norn's control. His body was replaced with porcelain white plates that resembled bone. He was now overtly a Phyrexian and no longer just a sleeper agent. He confronted Tafiri as he attempted to steal the Power Stone core of the Skyship Weatherlight, which contained the power the Time Mage needed to travel to the past. Ajani this time was defeated, and was sent back to Elish Norn to atone for his failure. Elish Norn instructed Ajani to oversee the dismantling of Karn, who was at one point the father of machines on New Phyrexia, albeit against his will. Elish Norn saw this as a natural step in assuming power over New Phyrexia. To be crowned the Mother of Machines, the old ruler must be ceremonially deconstructed. Though this process wouldn't be quick, Elish Norn showing a more sadistic side, tormenting the artificial planeswalker by removing his head from his body, but keeping him alive. Ajani would reveal his total completion to Tezzeret, who was working with Elish Norn but was still of free mind throwing him Elspeth's white cloak, which he had once cherished, over to Tezzeret to clean himself of grime. This was the final reminder of the connections he had in his mortal life, and Ajani has discarded it for good. The fight was now coming to New Phyrexia itself, as members of the Gatewatch, including his former friend Elspeth, were infiltrating the nearly completed plane in an attempt to stop Elish Norn's invasion of the greater multiverse. Though this was a relatively small strike team, the damage planeswalkers could have on their plans is worrisome. Ajani was sent out to kill these intruders, to welcome his allies into the loving embrace of the one as he had, and barring that, killing them, and ensuring the spread of Phyrexia. This would culminate in a titanic clash of broken hearts, as a completed Ajani finds Elspeth, who rejects his offer to join his new family. Ajani would grieve for Elspeth's lapse in judgment, but if she cannot be convinced, then she must be killed. Ajani leapt with superhuman strength and precision, striking down with his corrupted axe, his body looking more artificial than biological at this point. Elspeth parries with her sword, trying in vain to keep from slipping back and losing her footing. One small step means her death, but at the same time, she cannot will her muscles to attack a friend. She knows it's merely a Phyrexian wearing Ajani's face, but still, the hesitation costs her ground in the fight. With feelings of loss and regret boiling over, accompanied by anger at Phyrexia for stealing another soul she loved, Elspeth lashed out, but not with her blade. She uses the pommel of her sword to bash in the mechanical eye of Ajani, hitting him repeatedly until he lost consciousness. It may not have been pretty, but Ajani was still alive, and if there was any chance they could reverse the effects of completion, she at least had the hope of reviving her friend. Though Ajani was defeated, Elspeth and her strike team too would be unsuccessful in their attack on New Phyrexia. Many of the planeswalkers of the Gatewatch and on this mission had become completed, including Jace, Vraska, and Nahiri, with Jace being the one responsible for their ultimate failure. Elish Norn had secured her victory, as her invasion tree pierced the veil of reality between the planes and launched her invasion across the multiverse. The march of the machine had begun. As preparations were underway to invade the multiverse, Elish Norn made the completed Ajani one of her most trusted generals, essentially replacing many of her other Praetors who looked to share power with Norn. 
To solidify this point, Elish Norn ordered Ajani to execute the Black Aligned Praetor, Shieldred. Though she led the invasion of Dominaria, Shieldred was far too ambitious and power hungry to keep close. She was more useful to Phyrexia being broken down and restored as something more loyal to their grand purpose. Ajani carried out this order flawlessly and without hesitation. Next, Ajani was sent to the Plain of Theros, a world he was familiar with and had already taken steps to destabilize years ago by spreading the ill tales of the gods to the Plain's populace. The gods of Theros posed a powerful deterrent for the Phyrexian invasion, as they're incorporeal and powerful beings who could not be completed by glistening oil directly. However, Ajani knew the secret of the gods' power, and how they could use that in their invasion of Theros. To subvert the gods, all one needs to do is corrupt their followers. The followers' belief in the gods is what grants them form and power on Theros. With their followers completed, the gods too would become completed, acting out the will of Elish Norn. Take the faith, take the gods. Take the gods, take Theros. Ajani finished what he had started as vengeance for Elspeth slain by Heliod, and in his crusade, he managed to complete three gods, one being Heliod himself. With these powerful deities now working in line with New Phyrexia, Theros had little chance of survival. The plane did have its own defenders though, such as Ajani's former friend, Brahmaz. Though he didn't bring Elspeth into his new family, he did manage to at least corrupt Brahmaz, who now was a true pride mate of Ajani. Aside from the natives of Theros, the plane had allies in the Gatewatch, who had the ghost assassin Kaya go there to help delay its total completion. Using her ethereal magic, she actually manages to kill the corrupted god Heliod, which angers Ajani. The two would square off in another epic confrontation, with Ajani again falling short. He's beaten within an inch of his life before planeswalking from Theros back to New Phyrexia, as Elish Norn sets out a distress signal ordering all Phyrexians back to protect their mother of machines. New Phyrexia was under attack by members of the Gatewatch, the Native Resistance, and the newly released Army of Zophir brought by Tefiri. Ajani at this point was severely injured, but still defended Elish Norn with everything he could. He would defend New Phyrexia even to his dying breath. He would slay many of the fleshlings in this fight, but their invasion was destined to fail. The Gatewatch and their allies, led by a newly revealed angelic Elspeth, would see to Elish Norn's defeat and the subsequent expulsion of New Phyrexia from time and space. The march of the machine had ended. Though badly injured, the completed Ajani would survive this war, but with New Phyrexia outside the current time stream, he couldn't receive orders from the hive mind. This essentially meant he went offline and was inert, unable to think, move, or do anything. He was alive, but only technically so, and he was still very much a Phyrexian. Still out of respect for his deeds across the multiverse and their friendship, Elspeth carried his body out of the battlefield to look for any means to restore her friend. It was Karn who came up with a plan that could maybe help reverse the completion process. It was a spell that was used on him long ago when glistening oil looked to corrupt his heart, though it would take a substantial toll to achieve. Tefiri cast a slow time bubble over the group as Karn performed the ritual that removed Ajani's soul and spark from his body. He then ran them through his own spark, essentially cleaning them of the Phyrexian corruption. Then Malira used her own unique biological makeup, immune to completion, to restore the Leonin's body to its previous state, removing all traces of metallic plates or internal wires. When all was said and done, Ajani opened his eyes to a new world. It was like he was reborn, free of the cloud Phyrexia had cast over him. He was both aware of his terrible crimes while completed, but still saw them more as a bad dream than true memories. The cost of this miracle was substantial as Karn would lose his Planeswalker spark and Melira her life. Though disheartened by what his body was used for, this entire event didn't change who Ajani was at his core. He remained inspired by the efforts put forth by the Gatewatch and the defenders of the multiverse, who, even without him, stood in defiance of tyranny and won the day. He would have one final meeting with his friend Elspeth, who was now a totally different person. Still, somewhere in her eyes, she was the same person that Johnny had met on Alara years ago. But removed from them was all the fear and doubt that had plagued her all throughout their friendship. She was an angel now, a symbol of light and good throughout the multiverse. And she knew, even then, that she'd always have an ally in Ajani, who found her again even through death and completion. Their bond would always persist. 
Now in the aftermath of the invasion, Johnny sets out on a solemn mission, to uncover the fates of other planeswalkers who had been completed. How many were left in stasis as he had been? How many are still looking for a way to be freed from this terrible fate? And how many have fallen? Ajani, having survived this, thought there was no one better than he to reach out to these lost souls and try to bring them back into the light. The first of these he would find is Nahiri on her home plane of Zendikar. She was sent by Elish Norn to Zendikar leading its invasion, just as Ajani was with Theros. Though despite New Phyrexia's expulsion from the multiverse, Nahiri remained alive. She had uncompleted herself. Her spark had been cleansed in a similar fashion to Ajani's, but rather through the magical ley lines of Zendikar. Still, her body was scarred and distorted from the metal that made up her new form, and seeing Ajani basically in his original form, Nahiri's anger spilled over. For her home of Zendikar, she had given everything to save it from countless threats, but all the threats had one thing in common. They were tied to Planeswalkers. Planeswalkers to her were the true evil of the multiverse, and Zendikar would no longer suffer them, including Ajani. Ajani begged the regretful Nahiri, telling her that there was so much more good that she could do for the multiverse. She didn't have to end her story as a pawn of Phyrexia. Come with him and help restore the worlds they almost brought to heal. It may take years, but each good deed would bring them closer to absolution. Ajani didn't know, but Nahiri was no longer a planeswalker. Her spark was removed in the process that cleansed her soul. With nothing but rage left to drive Nahiri forward, she lashes out at Ajani. The attack causes the pair to tumble off a cliff. Ajani planeswalks away, fearing Nahiri is not yet ready to tackle the great challenges that lie ahead. He now sets out to the other worlds caught in Elish Norn's invasion, looking for other completed planeswalkers and hoping to spare them from a similar fate. Now that we've gone over Ajani's complete story as of the recording of this video, let's take what we learned from his lore and use it to go through his planeswalker cards, seeing them through the lens of his character development. And let's start at the very beginning, his very first card, one of the first Planeswalker cards ever, Ajani Goldmane from Lorwyn. In his first iteration, Ajani Goldmane laid out the entire framework of his character and what he stands for. He's a mono-white Planeswalker, which still is his primary color to this day. This is because of his strict sense of honor and his pursuit of justice. Despite being a Leonin from the Wild Shard of Naya, he stands out as almost being knightly in his ideals. Ajani Goldmane's abilities also show us exactly the type of magic he uses throughout his story, healing others, boosting the morale of allies, and creating avatars all using his unique soul magic. Though through several printings, Ajani would remain mono-white with a lot of similar abilities, there are a few cards that speak to his development as a character in the story. The first of which came in the Shards of Alara set with Ajani Vengeant, which most notably now contains red mana in its cost. In fact, you can argue, he's now primarily red with white being his secondary color. With this card coming in Shards of Alara, Ajani in the story was struggling with how to use his powers when fighting for his loved ones. His brother Jazal was murdered and he was seeking vengeance. At first he believed the path to honoring his brother was to take his rage and channel it into strength. This is reflected in his new ability that does direct damage to a target with his fury also destroying lands. However, in the story, Ajani's vow of vengeance goes mostly unanswered, as he found that seeking inner peace, honoring those we love, cannot be achieved through unbridled rage. After this, Ajani would drop the red color alignment and return to mono white, keeping it as his primary color. His card would then change again in the Theros story, as he gets a new printing in the Journey into Nyx set. Ajani, Mentor of Heroes, again adds a new color to his design, now having green in his cost. At this point in Ajani's story, he's really taken on the mantle of mentor to younger planeswalkers and heroes who stand against tyranny. This is his new mission, to travel throughout the multiverse, looking for sad souls, and teaching them how to rise up on their own feet and fight back against the forces that oppress them. The green mana in his cost being the ideals of freedom and resolve. The name of the card also has a nice tie-in with the story, since Ajani was quite literally acting like a mentor to the hero of Theros' story, Elspeth Terrell. Ajani would then keep the white-green color pairing through his next few appearances until we get to his most recent card. This is Ajani's Sleeper Agent. To me, this is the card most significant to Ajani's lore, and it certainly ties in a lot of what happens to him into the card text itself. Clearly, this is when Ajani is co-opted into the new Phyrexian hive mind, 
completed, and turned into a sleeper agent. The card name leaves no mystery there. But take a closer look at the art. He almost looks like, well, normal Ajani. This is because he's a sleeper agent and not a normal Phyrexian. He's not meant to be designed like a typical monster. We do get later art styles and variants showing off some of his more creative depictions, but for his main card, I feel that this is a great callback to the story. You can also see a lot has changed with his card to reflect his new status as a completed character, chief among them being the addition of Phyrexian mana or the completed mechanic. He's still white and green aligned, but now players can pay life to help cast him, which is very on brand for Phyrexians. Keeping his original colors is just more flavor that, that he primarily plays the role of a sleeper agent in the story. When reading off his abilities, it seems almost like a typical Ajani Planeswalker card until you get to its ultimate. This twists Ajani's magic from helping aid allies into something dark, infecting players with poison counters as others enter the battlefield, which just solidifies his status as a completed Planeswalker. Ajani has not since had a new card printed showing his uncompleted status, but on that day, I'm sure fans of this character will rejoice in having their Planeswalker back in his most iconic form. And there you guys go, the complete story of Ajani Goldmaid in Magic the Gathering and how his lore has gone on to affect his Planeswalker cards. Ajani Goldmaid is one of my favorite characters in MTG because he takes the entire notion of knighthood and chivalry and adds a decidedly wild component to it. He's one of the few prominent non-human planeswalkers in the game's story, and certainly one of the very first to be so heavily included in prints, which all gives Ajani a special place in the hearts of many Magic players who grew up slinging this special Leonin in their decks. Now, I need to call on you for help, and if you're as generous as Ajani is, I hope you can. This video took extensive effort to put together, and while I love Ajani, I know everyone has their own personal favorite Planeswalkers out there. So I want to know, which Planeswalker would you like me to cover in my next comprehensive video? Let me know in the comment section below. You can also help us out by leaving this video a like, sharing it with friends, and becoming a subscriber to the channel. It all goes a long way in helping the community grow. As always, I want to thank you all so much for watching and enjoying the content here at the Ether Hub. And until next time, guys... See ya!